Well, hello everyone and um, welcome to this, I reckon, very important event in the Australian literary calendar for 2021. Uh, my name's Gregory Day and um, on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you all on the Zoomosphere to the launch of Maria Takalanda's new poetry collection, Trigger Warning. There's, there we have the book. So um, firstly, I'd just like to, um, as we saw there on the screen, I'd just like to further acknowledge the, um, the traditional owners of the lands in which we're talking today, specifically in Geelong, it's the Wadarong uh, people and, and the library services extend out beyond Wadarong country into the Eastern Ma Nation. And um, where I'm sitting here today, I'm kind of on the border of uh, water on country and Gadabanud country. So um, I'd like to say Nurawari to everyone and acknowledge all that's gone on, all that's going on and all, and hopefully what will go on is gonna be great. So um, we'll do that so we know where we are and the ground we're walking on. So um, I send my best to all Aboriginal people out there and hopefully some of, some of those Aboriginal people are listening and tuning in today. Um, my name is Gregory Day. Um, I'm a novelist and a, and a poet and so forth. And I'm really happy to have the opportunity today to talk to Maria about her new book. Um, Maria, uh, I'll run, run through Maria's, well, at least some of Maria's many accomplishments. For those of you who don't already know, Maria is the author of three full length poetry collections plus a couple of other ones that have been maybe described as not full length. But anyway, the full length poetry collections are The End of the World, Ghostly Subjects, and now Trigger Warning. Her poems have been widely published, widely anthologized overseas and in Australia, anthologized in the great Best Australian Poems collections and Best Australian Poetry collections that of course ran for many years and did so much to kind of fire everyone on everyone up on an annual basis and, you know, inform the poetry community in this country. Um, she's also been anthologized in 30 Australian Poets and Me Too, Stories from the Australian Movement. Um, in 2015, Radio National aired a program sp specifically about Maria's poetry. She's performed her work on the tally on the ABC and also at the 2017 International Poetry Festival in uh, Medellin, I think you pronounce it in Colombia, um, which we might talk about a little bit today because that sounds like quite an experience. Um, Maria is also a prize winning fiction writer, of course, and her fantastic book, The Double and Other Stories was a finalist for the Melbourne Prize for Literature and was also named a best book of 2013 by the Australian and in other forums. Um, Maria's words can also be found in plaques, on plaques in the Geelong C CBD, um, out there outside in the world in three dimensions. Um, and they can also be found on the associated walking trails app that goes with that project, the Bronze Stories Micro Histories Project from a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. So um, Maria's a lot more than that too, a fantastic educator, mother, husband, and, and mother and uh, wife and so forth. So anyway, I just wanted you all to join me to welcome Maria today to this, celebrate this fantastic moment and this, this kind of unleashing of what is a really powerful collection of poetry. So welcome Maria. Wow, thank you, Gregory. I have never had an introduction like that in my life. It was <laughs> extraordinary. Thank you. And also your um, acknowledgement of country was, was a thing of beauty. Thank you. Well, it should be, eh? So, um, <clears throat> look, I, I want to start, Maria, by just, uh, just briefly describing how I first encountered some of the poetry in this book. Um, it was going back three, four years ago, maybe five years ago in Ireland magazine. Um, I read uh, a poem from the first section of the book, Confessions. The first section of the book is 10 poems titled Confessions. 
And they're all addressed to poets from the past and one of the present um, who have been basically at times looked at through the prism of confessional poetry. And the poem that I remember encountering first was a poem called Daddy, which was addressed to Sylvia Plath. And um, I just remember what an impact it had on me. I mean, I do read a lot of Australian poetry and poetry from everywhere, but this one was just had the most incredible impact because of the combination of the direct and very personal emotional territory you were dealing in, but the way that you'd been able to take that territory of your own that you were absorbed in and then hook it up to the tradition, if you like, hook it up to Plath, hook it up to um, the patterns that she'd made and the life that she'd lived. So thereby you were both inside the poem, but able to get that sense of craft and objectivity in the poem that placed it in a lineage of poetry without sacrificing the intensity and a very intense poem it is. So I just wanted to, and then I encountered a couple more, um, another one in an island magazine a bit later on, another one in Mianjin. They're all from that confessions suite and they all had that kind of same direct intense impact. They really actually seemed to be poems that were coming from a life, not from a writer's life, but firstly from a life and then with the writer's tools to kind of translate that. So I wanted to ask you just first up, let's discuss that confession section. And maybe you could help us by just defining for us in your view, what that history of confessional poetry has been for you and how it helped you in uh, manifesting some of these poems about your own personal experience. Yeah, the confessional poets were hugely important to me. So, I mean, in terms of this section called Confessions, uh, basically it's about my childhood experience of domestic violence, but also the legacy that I carried from that into my adult life. And just to give that a bit of context, uh, in the psychological literature about children who experience domestic violence, the damage that they incur is often compared to that of war veterans. Yeah. Um, so I felt that, you know, what, what happened was that, well, my husband had a, a, a terrible life-threatening health event and I essentially made it all about me, Gregory. That's what happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, to be less flippant, it was a kind of triggering episode for me because all of a sudden um, I was feeling um, emotions of, of fear and, you know, emotions around the precarity of my existence and, you know, the life that I have. Um, and that all seemed familiar in a very uncomfortable way. So his, my husband's health event was, was a triggering event and ultimately ended up triggering these poems. But in terms of talking about this experience of domestic violence and the legacy that I had as a result of that, I had no models to turn to. I, I'd never read anyone write about this stuff and I had no idea how to do that. Um, and so, it came to the fact that I started remembering and, and revisiting the confessional poets who in the 50s and 60s were the most radical poets you can imagine because they started talking about these you know, issues to do with mental illness uh, mm -hmm. and experiences of, of great intensity in, in relationships and in life generally. And really they paved the way for the conversations about mental health that we're able to have much more easily today. Um, so I, you know, I started reading them again and remembering too how important they had been for me as a teenager yeah. um, when I had no idea how to articulate my experience at that time. And in fact, you know, there was a, a great injunction on me to be silent about the experience, you know, for issues to do with family shame or, you know, society not wanting to hear about it or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I had no idea how to talk about this problem and the confessional poets were absolutely the ones who showed me how I might do that. And so how I started to do that was by engaging in a kind of conversation with them. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I think we experience poetry so often as something that's personally written to us. 
you know, we feel that we have an intimate relationship with poets. And I remember from reading, um, you know, Sylvia Plath and, and Anne Sexton as a young person, I felt they were speaking to me. I felt they were speaking for me. And so I suppose in responding to them, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to that feeling of intimacy as well. And that helped because I felt that I wasn't speaking to an audience. I was speaking back to these individual poets who had been so important to me. Yeah, that's a great explanation of it. So unlike in the usual run of things where um, stuff that matters is imprecisely expressed or garbled through kind of societal convention, you went into a territory where the people you were talking to had uttered things, kind of in some ways unspeakable things, they'd been able to speak about them in a very precise way. So number one, the bar is set high for you to, to do that too. But number two, you're in a you're in territory, a culture that you've created, which is which enables these poems, these amazing poems to emerge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, how else would I have written about them? I, I don't know. But also, um, the terrific thing for me about the confessional poets uh, is that, of course, they're poets. They're not just confessing that, you know, they're crafting these yeah. wonderful poems. And I remember the first time I heard Sylvia Plath read Daddy yeah. in a BBC recording. And so I'd grown up reading this poem since my teen years. That unbelievably is my phone ring. Um, I, be I'd grown up reading the confessional poets since I was a teenager and I didn't hear Sylvia Plath perform Daddy until um, maybe in my late 30s. And when I heard her perform it, I realised... Uh, that it was a performance, yeah. you know, that it wasn't just a gut spill, uh, for want of a, a better word, um, and that she was even kind of being a little bit camp in the yeah. way that she was performing this material, that she wasn't taking it all that um, seriously or, you know, there wasn't sincerity there in a way that I had previously read her poems as a younger person. This was a poet performing. Um, and, you know, I actually felt comforted by that because, you know, the poem is giving a lot away, but it's also a mask. It also provides some protection. Yeah. Uh, and so that dynamic between confessing but also hiding, uh, I suppose, was attractive to someone who was talking about something quite difficult uh, for the first time. And you touch on that kind of, um, <laughs> uh, it's almost some kind of moral issue. You touch on it in, in the poem uh, deeper into the book, where you are describing your experience in at the Poetry Festival in Colombia, where you're saying you you read poems from Narcissism, your book, and that you kind of perform them and you hand them up for this audience because you felt so inadequate in a culture where poetry could you could be performing poetry to a stadium style audience, a huge audience to which for whom poetry mattered, like say football seems to matter here. And and but you do make the comment in that poem that you hammed it up and it, it's for you now to try to forgive yourself for putting on that mask and and doing that. So it's a fine line, isn't it, between the mask, the hiding, the revealing, and in this act of artifice when you're dealing with your own very intimate content. Yeah. Oh, look, I still cringe about that performance in Medellin. Um, and uh, I don't know how, how many people in our wonderful virtual audience are familiar with the history of Colombia and of Medellin in particular, but for a long time then Medellin was caught in a terrible conflict um, involving uh, drug cartels, um, paramilitaries, you know, the formal the official government army, and there was a great deal of, of violence, uh, disappearances, bombings, murders, uh, rapes, kidnappings, the, the trauma that those people endured is, is just extraordinary. Um, and I went there in the year after a formal truce had been declared. Um, but prior to that, Medellin had been known as the murder capital of the world. Um, and so I was there at the festival, the first festival that they'd held. They'd been holding this poetry festival for decades, but it was the first one they'd held since the truce had been declared. And I was really struck 
that at every reading, before every reading, the organisers would acknowledge what had happened in the same way that you, Gregory, attempted to acknowledge today um, the, the suffering that has gone on in this country um, yeah. in, in its history. Uh, and at every event, they acknowledge the numbers of the missing, the numbers of the murdered. They acknowledge this tremendous trauma and suffering. And I was really struck by that because there would have been people in the audience who had experienced that, um, who had family who had disappeared or been, been murdered or, or attacked or suffered violence in some way. And yet they pushed through with insisting upon acknowledging this recent history, because of course, if you brush it under the carpet, if you pretend it never happened, there's a chance it will happen again. Um, but also another thing is trauma thrives in silence. Hmm. You know, trauma is, is far less um, productive when it's out in the open. Um, and what struck me about that festival too is that they never issued a trigger warning and trigger warning is of course the title for yeah. the collection but it's also um, a, a phrase that comes up in that poem about the Medellin experience yeah. that they never issued a trigger warning. It was important that people were discomforted by yeah. this, that they acknowledged how awful this was as essential to being able to uh, address it and recover from it. Yeah, and I remember having a conversation with you when you came back from that festival and how much impact it had on you. The, the poet's ability to say, to write in a way that mattered to the non-literary and the literary, to get outside the kind of the, the literary kind of territory, if you like, and, and how, a culture that's facing these kind of traumas must necessarily get outside just the little coteries that exist. And you asking yourself and questioning, and it comes through in the book throughout, questioning yourself about, you know, as you say in the book, writing from a point of privilege rather than pain. You know, poetry has come to you through education and through the ability to be able to read and do all those, those things. But that ultimately um, you want to do more than decorate the bourgeois kind of existence. You want to actually speak and you have territory in your life for which that, that trauma actually rings out. And so in this first section, Confessions in the book, um, that's the other thing I thought when I first encountered the poems. It, it, it struck me that maybe the bar is raised by, for you by going to a festival like that. Maybe you understand something that you can't understand just by sitting in Australia with our, where poetry is, you know, the equivalent of stamp collecting or something that's how it's seen in the general populace. So you, you are forced to raise the bar and, and go to what really matters, but you're doing it with craft, as you say. So these 10 poems are 10 poems. They're each 20 lines. Each of those 20 lines, there's 10 lines on each facing page. So there's a pattern and a mathematics and a design aspect to it as well. So you're actually dealing, it's kind of Pascalian in that way, you're dealing with this incredibly inchoate material, but then you are harnessing it into the poem. So maybe I'm really interested myself in how you deal with that, with the, where the where, how you can apply the craft and the form to material that is so close to you? What's the process mm. of doing that? Well, that is a very good question. Um, I think that um, for me, the material is material and I can view it as material uh, thanks to having gone into psychotherapy for many years. Uh, it is no longer um, uh, an inarticulate part of me that haunts me in a way that it was when I wrote my first collection. I think there's an enormous difference actually between my first collection, Ghostly Subjects, as even perhaps the name suggests, and this recent collection where I can speak more openly and transparently about it. And it's because for me, it has become akin to a material that I, that I have to manage. Yeah. It's been a history that I have to manage and yeah. now it's a material that I can to some degree play with. Yeah. And so I was asked the question the other day um, on 
radio, um, whether I found the experience of writing these poems cathartic. Mm. And I, I don't, I don't truck with that idea at all. Actually, I think, I think that uh, when you revisit trauma in your writing, you're just re-traumatized by that because you're yeah. having to inhabit the emotional space of that memory so fully in order to articulate it. It's not a, it's not a pleasant thing to do. And yet, and yet um, by transforming something complex and painful into material in putting it out there instead of in here, uh, there's, there's a, a pleasure to be gained from organizing it and arranging it, even in that mathematical or symmetrical way that, that you describe, um, because then it, that it becomes manageable. Mm. But at the same time, you know, in terms of that argument that writing is cathartic, I can only do that because I have been taught by professionals, not by poetry, by professionals in psychotherapy, how to remove that, that hauntedness and see it as something that I can deal with, something that I can address. Yeah. Oh, that's... That's very, very interesting. Yeah. So it's in part ex externalized to, um, to, pr to progress the internalization of it. So it's, that's another, see, uh, if, if everyone who was in psychotherapy could find access through poetry to that kind of process, like you have, um, the world would be a lot better place, but you have that ability with your aesthetic talent to uh, be able to detect actually an image or a, a phrase or a form within the poem that can turn this material into something for other people as well as for yourself. I mean, that's the thing. It's not, it's not just catharsis. It's not all about you, is it? Oh. It's about, there's a purpose to this far beyond you spilling your guts. And that's where, in a sense, the craft comes into it. Um, maybe it's time for for you to read one of the, the poems from this section, Maria. So for those who haven't had the pleasure of reading them so far, so that they have a sense of the type of poems we're talking about here. Um, how about Waking in the Blue, which is addressed to Robert Lau? Yes, yes, um, I can definitely uh, read that. Um, so Waking in the Blue is actually the title of a, a Robert Lau poem in which he describes his institutionalization after a breakdown. Um, and in my poem, I describe what might be called my institutionalization and that of my mother and sister in a uh, domestic violence refuge um, after my father had one of his breakdowns. So I suppose I am being a little polemical, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I'll, I'll read the poem. It's called Waking in the Blue. The night attendant at the service station, which was garishly lit when I had thought the world extinguished, pumps $10 of fuel into our tank. My plastic money box looks childish on the car's back seat, but the silver coins that spill from its plug hole perform an unexpected magic. My mother has nothing and I see how much it matters. She parks the Toyota on the side of the highway beneath some gums, their white trunks streaked by the comets of passing cars. My sister and I have my favorite blanket gilded with synthetic stars. At break of day, we enter the police station in our dressing gowns. Two faceless men escort us home where gravity has finally pulled everything down. On the carpet are light fittings, the TV's vacant box, the top half of the laminated wall unit, drawers and their contents, folded maps, loose photographs, volumes of an encyclopedia with their hard covers torn off. A more comprehensive list is not necessary. In truth, my room is not as damaged as I want it to be. My sister's has been carefully destroyed. My father is discovered in his bed as eccentric and confused as one of your old timers. But the police know to stay while my mother sorts through the debris for a bank book and some clothes and then the, the men in blue lead us away. There is a brick house 
with bars on every window, a room stuffed with bunks and a cumbersome wardrobe. At the kitchen table, women stub cigarette after cigarette into a tin ashtray, playing show and tell with scars, picking over the ruins. My sister has faith in a new miracle of creation, but I am a child, not a visionary. And our mother has already surrendered to the diabolical romance of return. My father, cleanly shaven, stands at the door. Inside, Earth's furious pull has gentled again, allowing the furniture, what was left of it, to right itself. The place looks enough like our home and our father's naked face enough like contrition. We restore our toothbrushes to the bathroom shelf where our father's glistening razor rests. Thanks, Maria. <clears throat> so when you're writing a poem like that, um, I'm interested in what's going on technically for you um, in terms of um, line breaks, um, rhythms, rhetorics. Uh, could you give us a bit of an insight into when you, you're obviously dealing with the material you're dealing with there and what the process is? What's, um, what, where, how do you find the form there? Uh, I can't say that from the first example of writing one of these confessional poems, I had the form already, <laughs> already in mind, but I suppose that um, mathematical form of the two stanzas of 20 lines each um, became a very useful way of containing the material uh, yeah. so that it didn't get away from me. Okay, I had this, this very strict form to adhere to and that was useful. Um, is that a form then, that you invented yourself? Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. yeah, I'll take credit for that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I invented that. Um, so, but I think that, yeah, so the, the form of it was very important. Um, the, the memories were there. So the content wasn't um, difficult to conjure. Um, but I suppose, you know, in terms of, you know, where, where the language and the images come from, um, you know, when... You know, poetry, and it's often said, I don't think I'm saying anything profoundly original here, um, does provide you with an avenue to talk about things that are difficult to find the words for. So, for instance, and look, that might be something that's really wonderful. You know, you might be in a forest and be overwhelmed with the feeling of being in that forest, the texture of the air, the, the beauty of the smells and, and what you're looking at. And so what you're feeling there, it's very difficult to find the words for it. And so you can feel your way into that through poetry as an entire tradition of nature poetry tells us, right? Yeah. But it's something similar with, with trauma, which is so deep and silent in your body. It's there as in a somatic way. It's there in very strong feelings and, and perhaps also in very strong images. Mm. Um, and as I said, those images are already there waiting. But you know, to find to find the words, you know, this is where you know the the rhythms and rhymes of language, you know, become so important because they're generative. Yeah. You know, they allow you to start producing words, and yeah. then um, once you have those words on the page, then you can begin to muck around with shaping them. But it's, I think, the the struggle when you're trying to communicate any feeling, whether it's awe or wonder or pain is to start producing those words and in poetry, the rhythmic nature of it, um, you know, that that's a generative force, I think. Yeah, I agree, fantastic. Um, there's the other element which you touched on with these confession poems where there's a sense in which those, um, those poem, poets who've preceded you are also, there's an element where they're providing you in a sense with permission, if you like, to deal with some of this stuff. And maybe now we could go to Deja Vu, the poem, the last poem in the sequence, which is addressed to Ted Hughes. And um, I think it's really a great way to end the sequence um, in the sense that you, you kind of go into this process of not knowing what to do, how to go about it, and then thinking about, you know, his trauma what he'd been through and that he'd actually, you know, 
been able to put it out there and actually work on it as as craft, like making a chair at the same time as making making sense for door. So yeah, yeah, that's that oh, oh, that's a really uh, a really interesting way of framing that poem. And thank you for that. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ted Hughes, and I'm not sure that it's politic of a feminist to say that, but I. <laughs> I think he's an extraordinary poet and I love Birthday Letters, yeah. um, which is the book that he published um, about, before his death, about his relationship with Sylvia Plath. Well, his take on that anyway. Um, and for those of you who aren't all that familiar with Ted Hughes, um, well, he was married to Sylvia Plath and she uh, killed herself, um, but also... Uh, then he took up with another woman, Asya Wevel, and she also killed herself. So, I mean, this is a man who, who went through a lot, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he may have also put these women through a lot. Um, so this, this poem called Deja Vu is addressed to Ted Hughes, and, and it is actually about a kind of moment of being triggered um, by my husband's health event. And then, as, as you say, um, wondering about the wisdom or, or something of turning that into material. Death was peeled away from my husband like a call. The months, nine, had been long, but there we were, reborn to the day, domesticating each fugitive moment more in need of such rites of order than ever before. It was still morning, the sun slanting through the black frame of the kitchen window like a cosmic portal, when the aftershocks hit. Not him, just me. They were like flashes of radiation, epileptic jolts coming one after another, shredding my hold on those routines that made the world seem rational. Each one dragged nausea behind it like a comet's tail. As I packed the lunch, drove my son to school, I stalled and sparked, but I have done this. I've done this before. Soon I was so memory full and memory less, it was as if I had been contaminated by the galaxy through which eons bled unchecked. I should have known that history, time traveller, takes any opportunity to repeat itself. I was intimate with its narcissistic sickness. Ich, ich, like your first wife, I had once sung, tongue stuck, ecstatically impaled by a past thrusting itself upon me like a man swan. Back then, I consulted an exorcist of sorts and bound myself to the quotidian, remaining unmolested for years until that sudden assault. There was nothing poetic about it, and I did not know how to make it so. Then I began to think of your gambles with the French mistresses of Ouija and Tarot, and Sylvia and Asia, of course. How the ungodly weight of the heavens cracked and blacked its light upon your sightless head, not once, but twice. And what poetry you made of it, deja vu. Brilliant, Maria, absolutely brilliant. And apart, I mean, apart from what the poem is obviously about, it is also, I think it strikes me as a, a a great tribute to Ted Hughes too, actually, what you're doing in that poem, because as you say, it's generative, the real thing when it's happening, it's breeding more. And unlike the silence that breeds more domestic violence, this speaking, this type of art breeds more of the same. And you've done like great justice there. So thank you very much for reading that. Um, in terms of the way the book is structured, it's structured in three parts, confessions and then domestic and then outside. And I'm interested to talk to you about um, the way you, because my experience when reading it was after reading the confession section, um, as, you, as you kind of say in that poem, you know, you, you didn't know, it, the world was changed. It was like, there's a sense throughout the book of the galaxies, the cosmos out there, the big thing being somehow in itself toxic. And you even mentioned in the book, cancerous. There's this inbuilt, as opposed to the romantic view of nature, there's this incredibly overbearing sense of the element we're in. And so you go from the confessions to 
basically a series of poems on domestic objects within the house. And, but we enter that, that sequence of poems with our world changed by the poems that precede it. So the defamiliarization process that you take on when you're describing the objects of the poems in that next sequence, cigarette, closet mirror, telephone, bed, dogged, cuckoo clock. Just tell us a bit about that process of um, that when the world changes through the shock, through the, the trauma and how the most normal and ordinary things can become very, very strange and eerie. Yeah, um, so I mean, that second section is called domestic and uh, domestic is a euphemism uh, for a fight in the home. And I suppose that um, when you grow up in an environment of domestic violence, the things, the everyday things of the home are haunted by those events. Um, so, you know, there's a poem on the television and, and that was an object that would often be smashed, upended, pot plants, likewise. Um, and in fact, in Waking in the Blue, I refer to some of that kind of damage that goes onto objects yeah. in the home. Um, and, and I suppose in, in these poems, uh, I hope they speak to a kind of healing, actually, because what I wanted to do was investigate them on their own terms. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the poems are about the histories of these objects or the significance of them, you know, in a cultural sense. Um, so I'm trying to de-invest them of, of that, that kind of personal history that I bring to them and, and reimagine them on their own terms. And I, gee, I hope some of them are funny. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> okay. I hope some of them are entertaining. No, they are. And that's the thing where you kind of, um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, there's something being dissolved by, by that first section. Some heavy weight is being lightened and leavened, which allows us then to kind of inhabit the world of the ordinary and the objects. And um, what about the poem television, Maria? Could you read that one for us, which is one of those defamiliarizing poems in the domestic section? Yes, I would be delighted to. Um, another thing that um, I read this on radio not so long ago, and um, but it was a very different type of uh, context. So I presented it as a lockdown poem. So if anyone is finding any of this context discomforting, just think about these poems. <laughs> it's written by someone who spent far too much time locked indoors with everyday objects and started getting weirded out by them. Um, but this one is indeed called Television. For millennials spelt with the electromagnetic, it will always carry a reputation for being outsized. They see Stalinist objet d'art hairdos shaped like turbine engines. Desperate, the TV has made itself over, purging the unseemly bulk, inoculating itself from static with that slicked back mannequin gloss. What it needs now is a different circle of friends. The question, how to leave behind those soft people, companionless even after all these years, still offering themselves for state programming with their cheap tumblers of hopes and fears. In the semi-dark, their faces are uncomprehending as moons. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Um, that last line, uncomprehending as moons, that, that leads me to this sense in the second half of the book of the <clears throat> wider environment we're in, including in your in the view, in the, in the consciousness sensibility of this book, um, we're not talking about um, just earth, we're talking about the element the earth is in as well. It's a very um, interesting uh, sense of space in this book. And as I said before, uh, far from a romantic one. Um, so you're dealing with the Anthropocene, of course, and the heating that we're all kind of experiencing. But I'm, I'm fascinated by this, view that comes through in the book very powerfully of, of a sense of that there's a section in the book about Chernobyl, um, the, 
the nuclear disaster there in Russia and the radioactivity of that and the symptoms of that and the effects of that. And um, there's, a, there's a sense of a, there's a portrait coming through of the Anthropocene, which I, it struck me as being um, quite unique. And it's not unlike say a Rachel Carson type portrait of a, a time when the spring goes in completely silent or everything is destroyed, this kind of post-apocalyptic thing. You're describing this as it's happening now as the birds, I think in, in, in one poem, there's this um, analogy where you're talking about the birds chirruping away with the Geiger counters in, in Chernobyl. So there's a sense that um, there's not a total absence of birds in this strange world we're living in, but there's a disharmony and a cohabitation of toxicity and natural, more ameliorating things. But they're cohabiting. And this strikes me as being, this is a reality we're in now. Um, and there's a very strong sense in, in the poems, um, uh, the poem, uh, Night, A Personal History, where you're talking about similar things, this sense of this vast macro space which is somehow informing the difficulties we're having in the micro, you know. What's your sense of that? Because most people are kind of, you know, talking about uh, nature as such as being uh, a far more redeeming kind of quality in life. But your, your portrait is there's something, there's something rotten. There's something cancerous out there, which we're dealing with. It's not just all about us. Oh, well, that, look, that is a really, difficult question um, and difficult to hear you say that about those poems because I don't think I was aware of it before but um, look we, we, we evolved on, on this earth we, we are part of everything that's on this on this earth but we are also at the same time uh, so minuscule as, as to be uh, irrelevant when we look at the scale of the universe um, I was watching a, a documentary the other night with my son on black holes. And so I, I should admit that I have something of an obsession yeah. uh, with space uh, <laughs> and with the context, I suppose, that that provides for everything um, for us here on Earth. And, um, and I suppose one of the things I would hope um, that suggests is that, you know, we, we just do have this life here on this planet. And that is the most extraordinary thing that we have managed to, to somehow scoop, you know, um, and that that needs defending. That should be our absolute priority. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, there's no, there's no, um, you know, we can't succumb to some romantic vision of our life here because in the context of the universe, I mean, there is something malignant um, about what, what lies beyond that and, and something so incredibly profoundly alien yeah. about who we are yeah. here on, yeah. on Earth, every species. Yeah. Um, and so I suppose that's the kind of tension that I'm, I'm trying to get at. And, you know, I'm not into, uh, you know, easy forms or representations of redemption, um, you know, and, and poets aren't, right? Writers aren't. Surely, um, and this is the this is the kind of complex stuff we try to articulate uh, as poets through the language of poetry. Um, you know, the, yeah, I'm I'm just going to stop there because it was a really tough question, and I really don't know how to answer it properly. Yeah, well, look, it's you've answered it really, really well, and and I I think the suffice to say that the. Um, it goes again to what I was saying about the confessions that there's a truth going on in these poems, which is such direct impact. You de defamiliarize the solar system for me, like the way that you're incorporating the toxicity around us into that larger macro sense, the unnerving nature of that, which we've all felt, but this is the first time I've read poems, which really goes to that and it's patterned through the book. It's in each section. There's lines referring to this, this sense of this menacing thing that is out there. And it's not just a human thing. It's something beyond us. Because we're just, as you say, a small part of it. So 
I thank you for that answer and sorry for posing such a difficult question. No, that was a terrific question. And I'll go away and I'll have a think about how to answer that better next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, <clears throat> well, unfortunately in this cosmos, we deal with the element of time, in this case, very linear time. And we're almost at that point where the time runs out. So um, I'm going to open up now to some questions um, from the audience. Now you can ask a question in the Q and A function of the um, of the of your screen, rather than the chat section. And already some people are asking some great questions. So there's one here from Craig Maria, which touches on something that we haven't had time to touch on, but something I wanted to ask you, um, and that relates to Finnish literary culture. Um, your parents are from Finland. How has, Craig wants to know how Finnish literary culture has influenced you or if it has influenced you? Uh, not greatly, I would say. Um, I no longer speak Finnish uh, with a great deal of proficiency, certainly not with the proficiency necessary to reading uh, Finnish poetry in its original form. However, uh, without a doubt, uh, some spirit of Finnishness uh, is there in, in the poetry. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate on, on how that is. Uh, I mean, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, who is one of my favourite writers of all time, um, said that, you know, if, if you read Arab literature, a genuine Arab literature would make no mention of camels. And that's how you would know that it is genuine. So <laughs> maybe my poetry is genuinely Finnish <laughs> for yeah. not uh, banging on about Finnish things. Having said that, there is a poem in there which is about um, the kind of pain I feel as someone who lost an original language. I spoke Finnish only until I was five. And then when I started school, uh, felt that the most important thing to do would be to fit in. What a terrible ambition terribly limited ambition that is for anyone in life to fit in but that's what I wanted to do and so I deliberately went about losing that language. Okay and yet there's a poem in the collection there teaching my son Finnish. Yeah yeah. Um, in which you the some lines are in Finnish. Yes. And, you, and that poem's a beautiful poem um, in which there is a sense that there there is something in your that's dealing with something linguistic at your core which is at least enigmatic to you. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the sound of the Finnish language, and, you know, there, there are yeah. many words and phrases that I still do have in my possession, in my vocabulary. But, you know, for me, the, the memory and the sound and the feeling of Finnish is still with me. I'm, I'm haunted by that. I feel that very powerfully and strongly. And I think that poem is about the you know, the feeling of, of a language. Um, and, you know, I am still trying to relearn it and also trying to get my son to take some interest. <laughs> I know that um, John McGahn, the Irish novelist, has talked about, I mean, he, he spoke fluent Irish Gaelic, but of course he never wrote in Gaelic. But for anyone who's read his prose, there's something going on in the cadence and the syntax there which is obviously informed, like a geology underneath it, is informed by the arrangement that takes place in phrasing in Gaelic. So when you were, when you were young, Marie, were you speaking Finnish first before you were speaking English? Oh, absolutely. Only Finnish for the first yeah. five years. And I remember starting school and it was quite an alienating experience <laughs> and a confusing one, uh, yeah. not being able to understand what was being said in, in the classroom. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's your original language and you are always uh, have an emotional attachment to that language that you first heard uh, as, as a child. Do, but do you have a sense of it being underneath your English at all? I, look, I don't know. I don't no. know how abnormal my English is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't know, no. Okay, all right. Um, um, Carrie asks, can Maria recommend some other fabulous contemporary poets we can read? Oh, gee, that's a... 
that's a tough question, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, there's just so much uh, terrific work out, out there. Um, oh, gee, I mean, I've been really fortunate lately to have a look at an early manuscript um, by Shastra Deo. Um, she's a really fabulous young poet doing really exciting things. Um, I know that uh, I have recently enjoyed uh, every book by Arlie Whitelock. I think she's uh, incredibly diverse in what she does in terms of uh, tonally diverse, tonally exciting. There's the comic there, but there's also the deeply moving. So there's two for you, Carrie. Yeah, that's good. Well, <laughs> actually, Ali Whitelock has asked a question here, Maria. So, um, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. And um, Ali wants to know about, I suppose, some of the variations in form you're using here in the book, like flow charts, for instance, diagrammatic kind of poems, typographical kind of elasticity you're using, and how, how you've, you know, how you end up there. Yeah, um, look, I, that's mostly, I suppose, in the, the poems in the third section of the book, um, which is called Outside. And I suppose in a different time, those poems might have been nature poems. Um, but how do we write nature poems now that nature is becoming so unnatural in the age of the Anthropocene? So um, I'm trying to write about the natural world and what's happening to it. Um, and to show uh, how, how unnatural that is um, by denaturalizing the conventional forms of poetry, I suppose. I mean, I do write um, a series of haiku in that section, but the haiku are about subjects that are unconventionally found in traditional haiku because they're about uh, cacti and other succulents and yeah. um, these kinds of you know, resilient plants that I think we probably need to start celebrating more uh, than we traditionally have. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, it does. And, and um, those haiku, were they related to the project you did in the Botanical Gardens in Melbourne? Yes, yes, that yeah. was a really terrific commission. I was asked to um, write about a location in the Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. And yeah. I chose uh, the area known as Guilfoyle's Volcano, which is um, planted with all of these just magnificent, um, you know, drought tolerant, dry climate plants. And uh, I got to know them quite well, or as well as prickly creatures like uh, those plants will allow you to get to know them. And I suppose it's no surprise that I was attracted to, yeah. <laughs> to something that was so prickly. Um, and and kind of alien to nature writing traditions. Yeah, well, the um, the sense I have in the book is that you've. What's interesting to me also, and I'm interested to to hear how it was done. The overall arc of the collection, because there's a beautiful patterning of themes going on throughout. Even though confessions, domestic, outside, and within those sections, there's quite disparate material, you're continually folding them back into the theme. So once I said before, like the macro to the micro, um, the personal to the objective, can you just give us an insight into the putting together of the collection? Because the poems have been written over quite a few years. So how many did you have to push aside and leave out? And what was the patterning kind of process? And how do you go about that? Well, I'll give you an insight into the putting together of the collection, which was that you, Gregory Day, uh, had a conversation with me one day and you said, Maria, surely you've got a collection by now. <laughs> and I said, I don't know, I'll better go home and have a look at that. And I did, and that's when it started to come about. So thank you very much for your input into that. Um, I suppose that, uh, you know, it was important to me that the collection did have an arc and that it did move away from the, the sort of claustrophobic, narcissistic uh, content of that first section um, and, and move, move beyond that. And I think that it is a tragedy uh, that there are so many people um, who are dealing with personal difficulties and as a result, they're not able to look 
at the macro, at the bigger picture, which is which is so in need of our attention right now. Yeah. You know, we, we all need to be able to focus on this most important, most overriding of all issues, which is, you know, thinking about how we, how we shift um, our, our ways of treating our home, the only home that we have, the only home we'll ever have. There is no planet B. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos now has joined the ranks of the, the space races. Um, but, you know, I don't know if anyone's seen um, Austin Powers and all of the memes associated with Jeff Bezos's rocket um, and its particular shape, but the man is a dickhead and a lot of them are. And, you know, this is it, for goodness sake, this is it. So, I mean, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the trajectory is about, you know, moving beyond, um, you know, this this stuff okay i had to deal with it but you know there's more important stuff that we all need to deal with if if we're going to survive and it's as i suppose as stark as that well this is what makes the book um you know so important i think and such a standout in the poetry of this country and just the general global poetry for this time the way you've been able to connect the micro to the macro. There's nothing narcissistic about the first section of this book, I might add, absolutely nothing. You're just dealing with narcissism as a concept and dealing with it so well and so honestly, dealing with your own um, pain, absolutely heart-rending pain, but also just dealing with the concept of human beings so centered on themselves. Um, the way you've patterned that through the book and assembled a collection that not only speaks privately, but speaks publicly and speaks to society as well as the interior domestic is quite amazing. So um, I want to congratulate you, Maria, and say how thrilled I am to be here today and with everyone else to celebrate what you've done. And I really hope that um, you understand how exceptional it is and that you know, we find lots and lots more readers for this book. Um, I should, uh, on that note, I should um, just say that uh, we're getting near the end of, the, of our time. Um, the Geelong Regional Libraries have a partnership with the Bookbird in Geelong West, a great little bookshop in Packington Street. And so the book can be bought at the Bookbird for all people in this Geelong kind of area. Um, and as I say, like, uh, it's, it's a bit like, you know, talking about words is always difficult, I think. And I, I think the way you've done it today has really um, been so impressive. And, <clears throat> and I just want to finally, because of this bloody Zoom stuff, and we weren't able to be in a room and actually celebrate for you and with you, um, I'd like to, just to end, I'd like to raise a toast to you, Maria, and to the book, to Trigger Warning, such a layered and beautiful achievement, um, and congratulate you and David and Sam on, on what you've done, and thank everyone for coming today, and yeah, here's to you, Maria. Oh, thank you so much, Gregory, uh, for your generosity today, it was really, such a treat um, to talk with you and, and thank you to the Geelong and Regional Library Corporation for always being such professionals and supporting local writers. And thank you to all of you out there in the virtual space. So I really appreciate all of, all of that love and support. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks for all your questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them and um, have a great night and run out and buy the book. Okay. <laughs> Bye, yeah. everyone.